Welcome to Driving.ca's virtual auto show. I'm Lorraine Sommerfeld, columnist and rancher in residence here at Driving.ca. Whether you're looking to buy or just an auto enthusiast, this is the time of year when hundreds of thousands of Canadians are pouring through auto show doors to see what's new. For the next hour, we're going to take you there, highlighting the new, the improved, the much anticipated, and the glorious technology the industry is unveiling this year. Viewers at home, welcome. You can submit questions to us. Uh, there's a question button on the screen that you're using. We'll be doing that in the latter part of the show. I'm joined by Driving.ca strong bench of experts today. Andrew McCready, out from Vancouver. He's the host of the Plugged In Con podcast covering the ever-expanding world of electric vehicles. Jill McIntosh is the mastermind behind Driving.ca's How It Works column and is with us today to share what she's looking forward to in the world of trucks. Stephanie Wallcraft is a motorsport expert as well as knowing all things family friendly. She'll be discussing what's new in the family hauler business, the vehicles built for many. And of course, David Booth, Driving.ca's lead writer who specializes in vehicles that are basically built just for him. Okay, one or two, the supercars. And with that, we're off. When you walk through the gates of most auto shows, there's always a prime piece of candy sitting right there, the best bling. Our auto show is no different. David's going to start us off with the McLaren Artura. David, what makes this one so special? Well, I've long contended that my favorite supercar of all time is the Jaguar CX-75. Don't bother looking it up. They actually never produced it. I was lucky enough to drive it, one of the few. And it, I loved it because it was a hyper hybrid. It was... Um, a small four-cylinder but turbocharged motor with a huge battery and a huge uh, electric motor that went like a Ferrari but sipped fuels like a Toyota Prius. I loved it to death. And that was 10 years ago. It's taken the industry about 10 years to catch up. And so the number one car that you should go look at if you were going to go to an auto show this year would be the uh, McLaren Artura. It's basically... A McLaren carbon fiber tubbed car. It's got a three liter V6 instead of a, the uh, turbocharged V8, but it has a 7.4 kilowatt hour uh, battery and it has about 94 horsepower of an electric motor. So you add it all up and you have 671 horsepower. You get to 100 kilometers an hour in three seconds. That's just about as fast as the very fastest supercars. We're talking almost up with there with the LaFerrari. It'll get to two, uh, 300 sorry, kilometers an hour in 21 and a half seconds. And at the top end, it does 328. In other words, there's nothing lesser about this car compared to say uh, something like a Ferrari Superfast, which has uh, a V12 and uh, 789 horsepower and is barely faster. In other words, you can be green and go really fast as well. Uh, and I'm told it'll do about uh, 30 kilometers uh, on electric range only. And that I'm told is because McLaren wanted it to be eligible to drive penalty free in downtown London where they all have all manner of congestion uh, rules and charges. So it's very, very cool. Okay, very at cool. auto shows, they don't put price tags on the cars, but generally speaking, this one. What's this McLaren going to come in at? It's, it starts at an almost, almost modest uh, 280000 bucks. Um, that said, I looked through the option list last night, and it was darn easy to get it, another 100000 on there. I mean, it's amazing um, what luxury cars will charge for something that's standard in a Kia Rio. It's really amazing. I, uh, I don't understand it, but the, the rich have money to burn and they're willing to pay, you know, a lot of extra dollars to have floor mats, it appears. Okay, we're going to go the other way right now. We're still going to stay in the electrics, but I want to bring Andrew into this conversation. And maybe, Andrew, you can st – the headlines this year have been huge for electrics, even more than usual, even though the stale sales still aren't reflected. What are we seeing? Are we gonna, what's the most important developments you've seen on the horizon for 2021? Well, uh, nice to see you, Lorraine, and everybody else uh, here from Vancouver. So, yeah, so, I mean, we are seeing lots of headlines. Obviously, a lot of automakers are, are committing a lot of money, a lot of uh, investment in electric vehicles. Um, I think what we're seeing is um, more vehicles coming to market, but I think more importantly, it's the volume of vehicles that are coming to market. Um, one of the things that's 
I mean, one of the things that has kind of plagued EVs in the in the last few years is is uh, waiting lists. So somebody wants an EV, they go to the dealership and they're told six months a year to get one. Um, Canada's kind of kind of like vaccines in a way. Canada seems to be a little low on the on the uh, on the list to get these things. Um, the good news is it seems like 2021 we're kind of turning a corner. Um, Hyundai, I mean, as one example, has said that they've got thousands of uh, Kona EVs in dealerships right now. So what that means is it's not so much, it, it's part of it is the waiting list. You want one, you go buy it. Um, but more importantly, I think what it is, is people can actually test drive these vehicles now. You go into a dealership and you can actually test drive a Kona EV um, or anything. Uh, so that is a big turning point, I think, because a lot of people, I mean, people who order Teslas have never even, I mean, a lot of them haven't even sat in one before. So they're actually getting a chance to drive them before. And I think that as anybody who has driven an EV knows, when you actually drive one, it's quite an experience, um, which kind of leads us into the theme of this auto show, what we're doing here, a virtual auto show. Um, we are all missing auto shows. I think one of the things that um, from the EV perspective, a lot of people, the first time, the only time they've driven an EV as is at an auto show. Uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal have had all these great EV ride and drives where people, the public, could come up and jump in any number of EVs and go for a drive around a block or whatever. So that's kind of an interesting thing in, in the sense that if people are now um, virtually trying to do this and it's not really uh, the best way, but with dealerships having cars now, it's a good thing. Um, so I think that's a big thing right now is that, that we're going to have more of these vehicles around so people can actually get a chance to drive them. All right, salespeople, we've had a problem in the past with salespeople not quite knowing all the parts to an EV and that's hindered sales as well, especially outside of places like Quebec. Are we seeing a sales force that's catching up to the knowledge needed to sell these? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I, on my podcast in the second season, we had a, a, a GM dealer on talking about the Bolt. And I mean, there are these kind of urban myths where you walk into a dealership, ask about an EV and they try to steer you away from it because they don't really want to sell it to you. Um, I think, obviously, as we talked about at the beginning with this, this investment and this commitment from uh, automakers, I think the dealerships now are starting to realize that this is uh, part of their future to sell these cars. So I think they're, they're, they all have experts in the EV space. Um, when you go into a Chevy dealer or, a, you know, a, a, a obviously um, Hyundai dealers. So I think that that isn't an issue as it used to be. This Bolt looks like the Bolt EUV looks like it's going to be a winner for Chev. Have you seen it yet? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's um, GM has committed a lot of money, a lot of uh, investment in these cars. They're talking about, I think, 25 cars in the next uh, five years EVs. So the Bolt is kind of the beginning of that. Um, the Bolt EUV in particular. Um, so EV with a U in the middle. Uh, it's a utility. It's a small crossover. Um a really interesting car. It's uh, kind of built on the same platform as the Bolt, which I think people might be familiar with, kind of this, the five-door hatchback. Um, but this taking a crossover point of view is more kind of to the, to, the, to the market that is the segment that is the hottest right now. We would definitely be seeing that EUV spinning around at a show right now. <laughs> you would be. You, um, you know, I don't think it would probably attract the crowd as the McLaren of uh, David's, but um, I think for a certain amount of people, they'd be very interested in it. It's, uh, I, you know, the, in terms of the numbers, it's, uh, it's, it's got a, a range of about 402 kilometers, according to GM, 200 horsepower, um, 65 kilowatt hour battery. And what's interesting about it is it has something called a, um, a dual level power cord. So what that does is it allows you to plug in um, to your typical uh, outlet 120, but it also allows you to plug into a 240 volt, which is kind of like what people would have their washer or dryer plug into. What that means is you don't have to install one of these fancy chargers into your house. You can actually just have an outlet in your garage, a 240, use this cord, plug it in, and you can probably charge this thing in about five hours. So, uh, you, you know, know it, that's, it, it's um, another you know, step in the evolution of uh, EVs. Speaking of steps and evolution, I'm going to move over to Jill now. We're going to talk about the F-150. Hopefully you'll start us off with that, Jill, with the hybrid, moving from electric to a hybrid. What do you see happening with the F-150? Well, it's um, the F-150 hybrid is available, and I think hybrid powertrains are going to be important for, for automakers uh, that make trucks because they're the next logical step. 
uh, in all the fuel saving technologies we've seen and, and trucks are dealing with things like cylinder deactivation, uh, light weighting, uh, turbocharging, anything to get these fuel numbers down. And hybrid, I mean, electrification is, is your next step. You've got Ram that has a mild hybrid system. That's, that's the e-torque. But Ford has put in a full hybrid, and it's capable of running on its battery alone. It doesn't go that far on it, but it's enough that it's going to help with fuel economy. You take the, the three-point liter V6 that is the, the, the heart of it, and with, a, with an F-150 that's just got the 3.5, it's rated at 12 liters per 100 kilometers. You put the hybrid system on it, and now it's 9.8. That's a big difference for regular drivers. It's an even bigger difference for fleets that are going through you know, all kinds of scads of, of gasoline. Fuel is one of the, uh, one of the number one uh, costs for fleets. And something I'm interested in, in seeing, I, um, I've driven the F-150. I haven't towed with it. And that, uh, that 3.5, it's an EcoBoost. It's turbocharged. So when you are, are hauling a load with it, uh, it tends to get thirsty. So it'll be interesting to see how this electric powertrain manages that because now you've got fuel-free power that, that's coming in. And... You've got, I mean, the, the, the hybrid powertrain, it boosts it up to 570 foot-pounds of torque, but it can still tow between 11,000 and 12,700 pounds. We, we have this, a, a lot of people have this idea that, that hybrids are this little thing that can't really do anything. And here we have a truck that can, that can actually tow, so it's not a weenie little system. And with the hybrid Ford has, Ford's got the onboard generator now in the new F-150. And in the hybrid, you can get one that makes enough power that Ford says it'll run enough power tools to frame a house. And all of these things are key to this because hybrids can't be technology for the sake of technology. These trucks have to do what trucks are meant to do or they're not going to make a dent in the market. When we're at the show, we're... I, I love all the tech you're introducing and I love hearing about the hybrids because you're right. There's got to be that bridge from the trucks that we all know and buy overwhelmingly to the new tech that's going to get that fuel economy down. At the show though, we're going to see kids climbing all over the Ram TRX, the Raptors, the, the play, the play trucks. What are we seeing this year? Oh, we're, we're, yeah, right now we'd be looking at the TRX and, and the Raptor, but these are the halo trucks. Um, just like many, uh, many mainstream automakers make a low volume but a high interest vehicle to get people looking. They're fun. They're going to sell every one they make. But it's also about publicity. And it's also one up for publicity. Now, you've got to remember, Ford brought, just brought out the Raptor this year. And next year, there's going to be a higher performance Raptor R. Now, Ram's TRX makes 702 horsepower, and you better believe the Raptor R is not going to make 701. So you're, you're going to have this uh, measurement thing going where everybody's going to one-up everybody else, and it's going to be for the sake of publicity. They're going to sell the trucks. The trucks are going to be real. People are going to have fun with them, but they're going to be just a very, very small slice of the truck market for these automakers. So these are like yachts, the one foot itis thing we hear about with the boaters. Yeah, the, that's that's pretty much it. it it's going to be you. We, we see the torque wars right now with um, with trucks, with the heavy duty trucks, where someone had nine hundred uh, foot pounds of torque, so the next next truck had nine fifty, and I had my money on when it was going to break a thousand, and sure enough, it did. And <laughs> then somebody had. 10 it had a had uh, like a thousand and fifty so somebody else had a thousand and fifty five it's just you got to talk about these numbers it, like same as with towing capacity nobody it, you know basically it's it's well our our truck can tow a house and nobody really does that but those are the numbers that that they want to um they, they want to put out there and even so, it's usually just for one model that does that. Uh, and the model that everybody buys doesn't. But uh, our, our truck will tow, like, you know, 150,000 pounds. And, and that's what people want to hear. 
Okay, we're going to move now from the trucks that, you know, do things that nobody really needs them to do sometimes. We're going to flip into the vehicles where people do need them to do what they're buying them for. And Stephanie, we're going to move into the minivans. That's what I want to talk about. These are vehicles that people actually are buying and for their utility. What's new? What's going on in minivan land? Right, exactly. I mean, we can talk about all these these souped up trucks and these supercars all we like, but the real purpose of an auto show is for people to decide what they're going to put in their own driveways. What we've seen in sales over the last year or so is that SUVs and light trucks have actually far surpassed cars. They're now over 80% of sales in this country. But here at Driving.ca, we've been bandsplaining to people for years about that minivans really are the most practical and useful family vehicle that you can buy. And now we're seeing that that segment has gone through a lot of change in the past few months. So let's start with the, the 2021 Toyota Sienna. This is a very, very interesting vehicle for the minivan segment for a couple of reasons. One is that it's not only available as a hybrid, but it's standard with a hybrid powertrain, which not only brings that fuel efficiency into the mix that has not been present in the minivan segment up until now, it also brings a lot of that same functionality that Joe was just talking about on the Ford F-150 hybrid into the minivan segment with things like a, a PowerPoint in the rear. You know, it's a pretty nice idea to bring a small microwave with you when you're going on a camping trip and be able to microwave a pizza pocket. Maybe not a very authentic experience, but it sure is appealing. Um, there's also a PowerPoint on some trims in the center console in the back to go with the HDMI connector so that you can connect a PlayStation or some other video game system to the rear, rear facing infotainment system in the back, you'll have your teenagers busy for, for years. You'll never hear from them again. And if you ask me, that's a pretty appealing feature in a family vehicle. Dodge Chrysler uh, invented this sector way back in 84, my first new vehicle. I thought it was cool. It was not cool, but I thought it was cool. <laughs> They're going through some changes. They brought the Pacifica out a few years ago, which really changed up their game broadly but they, they're also tweaking the market here in Canada name changes mostly can you sort out for viewers what's happening with Chrysler and Dodge absolutely well let's start actually with the fact that all-wheel drive has now got some there's some competition with all-wheel drive in this segment between the Toyota Sienna which has for many years been the only minivan available in Canada with all-wheel drive and the Pacifica that you mentioned is now also for the 2021 model year undergoing some model changes and also is available with all-wheel drive to go with those stow and go seats that have always been a, the most appealing feature of the Chrysler products. Um, the, the Pacifica is the upmarket version of Chrysler's minivans and there's another level again being added for 2021 with the pinnacle grade, which has quilted leather seats, um, these lumbar cushions in the same finish, upscale finishes on the inside. As, as we mentioned, that all-wheel drive, the seats are, are quite plush in the second row. So the pinnacle grade does not have those stow-and-go seats, which is something to know if you're considering between that and the Sienna in terms of what precisely you're looking for in features. But that's the upmarket version of the, of the Chrysler minivan. If you go looking for a replacement for your Dodge Grand Caravan, you're not going to find it on the Dodge.ca website anymore because it's been rebadged to the Chrysler Grand Caravan. And that is because um, it's the same product that's sold in the U.S. under the name Voyager, but there's so much uh, re brand retention in that Grand Caravan name that SCA in Canada, now Stellantis, decided to put that badge on the Canadian version to keep that connection between the products. But what you're really getting there is the pre-refresh version of what was the Pacifica in terms of the styling, the, uh, the exterior features, um, and a little bit more of a down market experience in the interior of the minivan. Uh, you won't get that all wheel drive option, but it's really more for families that are still looking for that budget minivan um, and, and looking for it within the Chrysler lineup to get those, those features that you're looking for, like the stow and go seats and such. So, so many name changes. I was hoping we could clear that up. I'm a little bit more confused now. I'd forgotten about Stellantis <laughs> making great product and still and go seats all the way. We're going to flip out of minivans now, literally. Uh, David, I know I usually pick on you for supercars because that's um, your bread and butter and it's also where your heart, where your heart beats. Let's go for a different approach though now. The two-seaters, the roadsters, the sports cars that people buy, that we can buy, that we can have in the driveway. Nissan, when they announced they were discontinuing their 370Z, it's like, oh, yeah. So what are they What are they doing? I know you've seen the replacement. What's going well, on? 
as much as the uh, you know the McLarens and the Ferraris um, really attract the you know uh, tire kickers and everything else, I suspect that more people will be visiting the Nissan booth if there were an auto show to look at the uh, the new replacement. It's got officially called the 400Z, but everybody's calling it the Z Proto. And I was lucky enough to see it about two years ago amidst a whole bunch of other Nissan and um, and Infiniti um, prototypes and. It was definitely the one to have. I mean, it was pretty impressive. It's really, really a good looking car. It's got the best of the 240Z. It's got the best of the nine, uh, the 300ZX and ZX twin turbos around of the 90s. It's got a little less of the 370Z in it, and that's not a bad thing. Um, so it's harking back to those cars that really, really made an impact for Nissan. But on the other hand, it's got the very best of technology. It's basically got the um, Q60 Infiniti Red Sport motor, which turns out to be a three liter turbocharged um, V6, which is good for 400 horsepower, which I guess 400 Z is now horsepower instead of the displacement of the engine. But it should be really, really hot. It's also probably gonna have the Q60 Red Sport um, suspension and brakes. So it should go as well as it shows. We're pretty excited about that. Um, that all said, you know, I mean, you accuse me of loving supercars too much. Well, I actually like little underpowered sports cars even more. You learn more about driving. You have more fun. You don't scare yourself. And uh, to be honest with you, if I went to a track myself more than the McLaren, I'd probably get the new Subaru BRZ, which is going to be, you know, would be at shows if it was there. It's got a little more horsepower this year. They put a 2.4 liter engine in, in it. It's got 20, 228 horsepower. That's up from 205. Um, um, just enough to get you in a little more trouble, but not enough to get you in too much trouble. And it looks better. It's a little longer. It's a little lower. It's got better headlights. It's a traditional cab back design. It's, it's a traditional sports car. And you've even got vestige little rear seats. It's sort of like a, a Mazda Miata for grown-ups. You know, it's it's really nice. And the other one that is pretty cool is um, the Elantra N-Line. Uh, not the full N Sport. There'll be one of those coming with 275 horsepower. This is uh, their budget version. Goes for about 27,000, 28,000. And it's got 205 horsepower, I think. 195 um, uh, foot-pounds of torque. Front-wheel drive. You can get it with a six-speed manual still. And uh, it's, it's going to be quite cool. And those are the cars that are truly fun. You know, you show off the McLaren, you go have fun in these little cars. Thanks, David. Andrew, going to circle back. Question, we're at the auto show. What's the sexiest new EV? Is that, a, is that an oxymoron? What's the sexiest oh, thing that you're seeing? At well, you know, just coming from David, I mean, if David would be perfectly honest with everybody, he'll tell you that the Porsche Taycan all electric is probably one of his favorite cars. I, right, I agree David? completely. Okay, so um, Audi, who has uh, jumped into the e e into the EV space with their e-tron models, um, has kind of come up with their own answer to the Porsche Taycan, and that is the GT. So uh, Audi e-tron GT Quattro, and then their performance model, uh, which is the RS e-tron GT. So these are four-door coupes, which uh, talk about oxymorons, there you are. Um, these are uh, high performance, um, very expensive uh, e EVs that uh, have, have taken a lot of their, um, their uh, technology from, uh, interestingly enough, the race course, um, the uh, Formula E Audi is involved in, and they've learned a lot about thermal management, um, which is a big key for EVs, especially performance ones. One of the interesting things uh, among so many that this thing has on it is uh, uh, the management system. So it, a thing about EVs is when they're, you know, everybody talks about, oh, in the winter time, it, what's, what's going to happen and things. So they've kind of come up with a, a solution in a sense to, to warm the cabin from the heat of the battery. So they use the, the they have this interesting thing with all their, their coils and, uh, and uh, um, systems where they, they transfer heat from the battery pack into the cabin. So um, that's one of the many interesting things about this thing. It has something called boost mode. That's not beast mode, boost mode. So for two and a half seconds, you get uh, over 500 horsepower in the GT Quattro and 646 horsepower 
in the RS model for two and a half seconds. So essentially it's like a launch control. Um, 85 kilowatt battery, uh, fast charging, same as the Taycan. So you're going from about uh, 5% of battery to about 80% in 23 minutes, which is pretty impressive. Um, what is also impressive, as I said, is the price. So uh, the base model is about 153 US, no prices in Canada yet, and over 200 for the RS. So uh, it's also got a bit of unobtainium in it. <laughs> unobtainium, exactly. <laughs> okay, back to obtainium. I'm going to go back to Jill. We've been talking about the big trucks and the tricked out trucks. What's really coming through the market now that you see is going to fill a niche? We're looking at the mid-size pickup trucks, and I know Nissan has a lot riding on the Frontier. What are we going to see with that new Frontier? I, I think the Frontier is going to do very well for itself. Now, mid-size trucks, they run a distant second to full-size trucks in Canada and in the U.S., but they make so much sense because big trucks are TFB, which stands for too friggin' big, that's not quite the word I use, but that's the word that my editors let me use. And you, you look at these mid-sized trucks, which are almost the size of what full-size used to be. It's easier to get in and out of them. You can park them. You can spin them around in traffic. And I always liked the Frontier. I, I liked that it was comfortable. It was a stout performer. It, the biggest problem was it was thirsty. If you got that V6, it, it, it went through a lot of fuel. Now, this new one, it, it really is styled nicely. I love the styling of it. The interior is all new. It looks great. And it has a new 3.8 liter V6 that should solve that efficiency issue. Um, in the, in the mid-size market overall, Tacoma rules there. there there's no question. It, it actually outsells the Tundra. And I don't think that's going to change. But I think this Frontier is going to make waves in this segment. We, we've got a segment where just about everybody is in it. Um, you've got the Colorado Canyon uh, from GM. You've got the Ford Ranger. You've got Honda Ridgeline, the Jeep Gladiator. And I think Nissan is, is, is it's going to have a contender here. We can't leave this segment without talking about the Bronco. It's one of the most highly anticipated reveals I've heard from in a couple of years we're starting to show up on the road what do we know about the bronco and the bronco sport um well we do know that we're it's still going to be a while longer before we see the bronco um the bronco sport is out it's it's the the milder of the two based on the uh, escape platform and uh really i think it's, it's going to outsell the the the, the heavy duty bronco but I will say that Ford did its homework here on the Bronco that we've yet to see. The, the, the Wrangler's king of the hill. There's no question. But it looks like the Bronco addresses some of its shortcomings. You can take off the doors and you can take them with you. Uh, if you want to take the roof off, one person can do it. I, I've tried to do it on a Wrangler. It's a job and a half. And I really think the Jeep's going to have to look over its shoulder here because this is a niche segment. But really, more people buy them that don't go off road that actually do anything with them. It, it's I, I don't I don't go off road, but I want to make it look like I can. I want to know if I ever did if I can do it. And I think the Bronco is 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 going to be. I mean, it's going to be a while before Bronco supply ever meets Bronco demand. Well put. I know the uh, the past year in the industry has pushed off a lot of product being available to the public. It's pushed off a lot of parts being available. Even chips have sent production down and we're coming back online, but it's been a heck of a year in this industry and there's been a lot of catch up um, from every manufacturer. Nobody's been outside of it because we're so, it's such an integrated worldwide chain and it's just been crazy. And the Bronco keeps being pushed back and I know people are waiting for it. So hopefully we will see that soon. Until we see the Bronco, I want to go back to Stephanie now and move into the three-row monsters. I can't believe how fast they sell, considering how much they cost and how big they are. But Stephanie, what, what's going on here? What, what's the big news here in the three rows? Well, if somebody were walking into an auto show, if there were auto shows this year looking for a three-row SUV, the vast majority of them would be headed for the Jeep booth to have a look at the Jeep Grand Cherokee L. Um, the Jeep Grand Cherokee has been a darling for the Jeep brand for probably longer than it really should have been. It's up until 2021 model year. It's been the same pretty much for, you know, with, with light refreshes for a decade. 
and it still sells really well. Um, it's, it's buyers sort of look at it almost as, as if it were a luxury vehicle and, and treat it as such when they're, when they're pricing it out, when they're, when they're uh, deciding what features to put on it. And that's because people flock to the Jeep brand for, for that capability. And now they're going to get it in a three row SUV for the first time. This thing could probably put the Palisade, the Hyundai Palisade and the, the Kia Telluride, which are the new players that are doing extremely well in this segment already on notice because it's going to end up a little bit pricier, um, probably actually more than a little bit pricier when you put it all together. But it's also going to have three different all-wheel drive systems available on it. And the, the most expensive one having electronic limited slip differentials on both axles. So we're talking about serious capability that is not necessarily available elsewhere in the segment. And people are going to notice and they're going to pay attention and they're probably going to pay for it because we're seeing that Canadians are willing to pay for the vehicles that they want with, with transaction prices going up over 40000 on average for the first time in December last year. What are we seeing in the traditional ones, the Navigator, Tahoe, Suburbans, the Yukons? Are, are these still as forward as they were? Are they still as desired? Or are the new kids pushing them out? Well, I think, I think when you're talking about the really large SUVs, what was that acronym that Jill used, TFB? <laughs> um, they are, the really large SUVs will always have a place for people who need to, who want to move six, seven people around comfortably, adults, and tow a boat or a trailer. And, you know, they, they truly need all that capability. Um, certainly the, the uh, GMC Yukon, the Chevrolet Tahoe, uh, the Cadillac Escalade all came out um, redesigned in the last few months. Um, and all have their place and all are very impressive in terms of their capability. The suspensions, the new suspensions on those things are magic. Um, and so, but they are also very expensive. And so I think there's a place for both. It's just a matter of meeting the budget needs of the different families who, who really can take a, take a step back to assess, you know, how am I going to use my vehicle? Do I really need, you know, an enormous SUV that's, that's, capable of towing and, and has room for six adults or is that third row an, an occasional need for me I can I can get away with something smaller that can tow 5,000 pounds it's you know every family's got different needs and different budgets and and I think that that that's exactly why these segments exist the way that they do to meet those different needs I've heard you mention before and it's a really great point that people buy the car they think they might need one day or one day of a year when everyone's going to the cottage or for a trip and they tend to overbuy, like they'll buy something huge, imagining a day instead of their day-to-day, -day, like driving around. And do you think part of that plays into this and why they maybe stay away from the minivans, which are probably better utility, even though they don't have that word in their title? Yeah, I think it very well could be. Although I think also the, the minivans get short shrift in terms of how people consider their capability. A lot of it has to do with, um, the all-wheel drive capability, which we just discussed, is opening up in terms of competition in the minivan segment. But there's also um, ground clearance is a big factor for Canadians when they're thinking about getting over those snow drifts that the plow leaves at the end of their driveway, right? Is a minivan going to make it? But truthfully, other than, you know, if you've got a really rough cottage driveway and you're worried you're going to bottom out on a rock or something, a car or a minivan probably has enough ground clearance for most people who live in the city in Canada. And so I'm not, you know, it's, as you said, it's people really, they're buying for the one day. They're buying one day I might need to go to a friend's cottage and I might bottom out on a rock or one day I might need to take Bobby's entire soccer team to practice and I might really need that third row. Um, and so it's, it's really up to the individual family to decide whether that one day, you know, if there's one or two days a year when you really do fully need all of that capability, is it worth spending that much extra money? What we're seeing is people are saying yes, because as we just mentioned, they're spending more on their cars than they ever were. Is it necessary? It's a different question. I might bring David into this part. Mitsubishi just unveiled their new Outlander, the plug-in hybrid Outlander, which has done really, really well for them the past few years. Far and away their best, best product, I think, that they've got out there. And the new one looks pretty fierce. They did a lot of design changes on it. And I know, David, you were you've written about this. So maybe the two of you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the Outlander. Well, the, uh, the, the, what's interesting about the Outlander is the Outlander itself, the base uh, gasoline model is all new and it's sexy 
It's the interior, which has been Mitsubishi's biggest problem over the last decade by far, is really, really leaped into the, uh, into the mainstream. Quite well done. Congratulations, Mitsubishi. The interesting thing to me, however, is that the big news from, um, from Mitsubishi in the Outlander world has been the PHEV, the plug-in hybrid. It's done out incredibly well. It's put them on the map where they weren't on the map before. Unfortunately, the old version of the Outlander is getting a mild, uh, PHEV is getting a mild refresh, but it's not going to be um, based on this new really dynamic one. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that's happened. Um, maybe they're waiting for technology from the uh, Renault Nissan uh, Alliance uh, to move forward, and 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 they're not producing it themselves, and so they have to wait uh, for you know other technologies and other models that will be in as part of the alliance um, uh, to come together. That part is kind of strange to me. Um, and um, I think it might hurt them a bit. Um, but like I said, the main um, Outlander, the base model, is really quite snazzy. I have nothing in particular to add to that. David covered most of the important points. Um, I think that the Alliance influence is really showing through in the new Outlander significantly. Um, and I also think that with the changes, we're going to be seeing a lot more of it. Um, it was not necessarily a vehicle in the past that would have would have entered consideration for a lot of families or for a lot of us reviewers, whereas now, um, as seven CSUVs go, I expect to see the name around more often. Well, in fact, uh, Stephanie, the, the, the motor out of it is right out of the Nissan Rogue, 181 horsepower CVT transmission. It's, it's purely an Alliance vehicle. They haven't got around to doing the PHEV yet. That's why it's, you know, we're soldiering on with the previous model. Well, and the rest of the Alliance doesn't have PHEVs, so it would be Mitsubishi bringing that in to to the alliance uh, um side of things so uh, yeah your point exactly it's you know things moving both ways not at the same pace necessarily. exactly okay can, David, I, can i add can i add something there just about the electrification of the, the the new phev so as david says it is a refresh um however they have kind of upgraded the powertrain in the phev a little i mean it's not a lot but um, it did have 35 kilometers of full electric range. It's now 39 kilometers. So. <laughs> hey, four oh. kilometers. That's to the store and back. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's that's my my uh, two cents. Most importantly, though, regardless of the changes, it still qualifies for the federal and provincial incentives with the way it's being priced with the updates. I think that's the thing that's the biggest factor in in choosing a PHEV or a battery electric for Canadians at this point. Great point. Very good point. Great point. Yeah. Okay, David, I'm going to, I have a question from a viewer, actually, I'm going to put it in now because we're at a good spot for it. Um, if there were auto shows this year, it would have been great to see some of the newest EV entries like Lordstown, Neo, or Rivian. David, which of these electric trucks do you expect to actually hit the market in 2021? Ooh, I'm, as long as we count late 2021, um, I think what you're going to see is the GMC Hummer EV, which I think is quite exciting um, uh, with its Ultium batteries. And it's got, well, you know, they said something about 15,000 pound feet of torque, a little bit of uh, marketing there, shall we say it. Um, but that one's going to hit. I, I'm not sure about the Lordstown. Um, the Rivian, I, we might see. Uh, in time, and and obviously that's exciting. Uh, I'll be honest with you. The, the 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 incredible thing about EV pickups right now is how little news you hear about the Cybertruck. Uh, I don't know when it's uh, going to hit. Um, and unlike previous Teslas, where you know there was a countdown of uh, like for the Model Three, every time it hit a hundred, an extra hundred or the two hundred thousand deposit marks, there was a big news. The Model Three, the Model Y, they were constantly in the um, in the news, uh, since that initial splash where everybody went, oh my God, it's the future. Uh, we have not heard very much about the Cybertruck at all. Um, I don't know if that speaks to a lack of popularity um, um, uh, in the larger scheme, or if the Tesla people haven't really bought into it a lot. All I know is it is the most silent introduction by Tesla for, and that's a company that's never silent about any of its introductions um, and, that I can remember. So uh, I don't know when that's coming, 
Um, I don't know what it'll look like, in fact, in the end. I'm, I'm not sure they know right now. Okay. Andrew, I have a question for you. Wayne yes. is wondering who, besides Tesla, is building the best EV in 2021. Wow. Um, I mean, best in terms of affordable, I think Hyundai with the new Ionic 5, it's their third EV and their, 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 uh, their, their quiver, as it were. Um, I think Hyundai is making great cars. Kia Soul EV, I think, is a really great vehicle. Um, you know, there's the thing about EVs is there's not really, I mean, this is a bit biased, but they're all very solid. They're expensive. I mean, let's face it, that's the problem with EVs is that for a comparable gasoline engine, you're sometimes double the price. So that is the issue. But I think Hyundai is making great ones. Um, I think Nissan, the Leaf, to me, has always been one of the best EVs. The Nissan area that comes out soon, hopefully this year, maybe next, um, I think is probably going to be a real, uh, real popular crossover when it comes out. Um, it's taken a long time for Nissan to follow up with the Leaf. Um, they've had issues, I think, at the corporate level, obviously. They're much publicized CEO issues. So I think that kind of got stalled. But I think um, Nissan, Hyundai, Kia, um, and the Bolt. I think the Bolt EV, EUV is going to be a big one, too. So um, it's not really an answer in terms of who's doing the best. I think they're all very good. I, I If I can jump in, um, as... Um... Uh, Andrew mentioned earlier that the the new Taycan is by far my favorite EV. I know it's a rich person's car and everything else like that. But the reason why I like it so much is not only is it a good EV, but it's the best handling four door um, sedan you can buy for any money, regardless of propulsion system. There is simply no better handling four door car, gas, uh, plug in um, EV in the world right now and you know um we are always judging evs just amongst their specific ev competitors and uh, we occasionally mention them in their acceleration versus gas powered cars but that's it this is a car that actually handles again way way better than anything else with four doors like just blows the doors off a bmw m5 just puts it on the trailer fantastic car it's on the trailer. Okay. Jill, I want to come back to you for a second. Nick's wondering why compact trucks are not part of the market anymore. He mentions that the midsize ones really aren't, which I totally agree with. Remember the original Rangers? They look like they could go in the kid's toy box now. I thought they were awesome. But he's asking why there's no cheap entry level small pickups anymore in the market has just fallen out. Part of the, part of the reason is there. there's just there isn't a market for it. Um, there is in in uh, in other other parts of the world, but North America um, we tend to buy by pound. If I'm going to spend this much money, I want this much truck. And there comes a point where you can only make something so inexpensive. Um, no matter what it is, whether, whether it's a, a, an F-350 or whether it's a Ranger, but uh, don't expect to see those come back, if ever. But if we do, it's going to be something like the Hyundai Santa Cruz, which is totally a lifestyle truck. It, 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 it's not, a, I mean, I, I think it's a truck, but it's not going to be perceived that way. It's a car with a bed, basically, isn't, isn't it? Just with an external bed as opposed to a trunk, which there's a place for that if you need to get around stinky hockey bags. And, oh, and I'm... This fills that, that need, right? Well, even I had a Ranchero back in the day, yeah. which, which, <laughs> was a, which was a Ford Torino with a bed on the back. And, of course, General Motors made the, uh, made the El Camino and the, and the Diablo, mm -hmm. and uh, Subaru had the Brat, uh, Dodge had the Rampage. But these, but as much as we look back on them and wow, they were great, even in their day, they didn't sell that much um, because people just don't perceive them to be trucks. And a, and a little truck, yeah, they'll they'll do it, but people don't people don't see it that way. And what's really funny, I have, I still own the 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 only brand new vehicle I ever bought, which is a 1995 Dodge Ram, 
And when I bought it, it was the largest half-ton pickup you could buy that year. And now it looks like a midsize against the big trucks. Well, one day I did a comparison where I, I, I got as close to that configuration on a new truck as I could. And my truck actually had more towing capacity and more payload capacity because it, 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 all of its uh, capacity was not taken up with bulk. With, with needless bulk, but that isn't the way we look at trucks now. I got a big trailer, I need the big truck to pull it. So it, it, it's all about perception. Well, and and uh, I don't know when somebody's gonna blink and make a smaller one. And, and let's, uh, let's understand this, um, the, the luxury segment, if you define the luxury segment as uh, vehicles that cost over $60,000, uh, the luxury segment is dominated by pickup trucks. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, General Motors sells way, way more um, over uh, $60,000 pickup trucks than, than say BMW does over $60,000 cars. Uh, you know, uh, the Denali is uh, for GMC is, I think 60% of the vehicles they sell are Denali's. I just, uh, I just, I've test, I just tested a, it's an SUV, mind you, but I just tested a, uh, a Yukon Denali and it was $95,000 and you can get pickup trucks easily to that amount. So understand that um, uh, the, the market, it's not just sheer bulk, it's sheer price and sheer equipment. And the interior I, quality yeah. too. The interior on some of these, like the uh, the Laramie Longhorn Ram fifteen hundred, is gorgeous on the inside, and I think it's just about six figures. So people are buying their trucks for their capability, but they're also buying their trucks for for their appearance and their cachet now. And it's it's a balance of, of all of these factors. Well, the the Denali the Denali is actually when you think about it, it's what's keeping GMC alive, um, because in Canada in in, in Canada, the it's about 50 50, 50 uh, Chevrolet and GMC trucks. In the U.S., uh, Chevy outsells it. I, I I'm going to say it. It might even be 60 to 80 percent uh, in Chevrolet's uh, factor. But as you were saying, David, the Denali, and I think 60 percent of Denali might even be low, um, and that's why. That, that's one of the reasons why GM is keeping the GMC uh, brand around is because so many people are buying the Denali and the high country, the Chevrolet high country, which is the new, um, the new luxury level is still not, it still doesn't have that cachet that the, that Denali has. Denali is the truck's truck. What's interesting is I don't think we've seen the ceiling yet. Um, so far they keep raising the prices of these vehicles as we said, it almost touching 100 large, and it doesn't diminish their popularity. In fact, in fact, it increases their popularity, and they become a larger percentage, as as Joe mentioned, of the of the uh, of the total sales of that truck. I suspect we're going to see a hundred thousand plus pickup truck. From okay, I want to bring this back down to earth for a second. Okay. Um... Okay. <laughs> Mary's wondering if Toyota Corolla Cross and the redesigned Honda HRV will be coming to Canada. This is for anyone that might know. I can't speak to the Cross. I uh, I mean to the HRV. Um, uh, I believe that the uh, the Corolla Cross will be coming to Canada. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. Ronald would like to know if consumers should be buying an EV now or waiting for superior battery technology. This is a perennial question in Canada. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, you know, you're seeing most EVs now with about a 400 kilometer range. So if you're waiting for something that's going to be double that, you're going to be waiting a long time. Um, I think a lot of people have been kind of waiting on EVs. Um, I think this year, 2021, 2022, you're going to see a lot of new ones come to market. So I think it's probably a time where if you've been waiting to buy one, now is a good time. Um, you're not going to see a double of range, um, you know, maybe even 600 kilometers. That technology will come, um, but it's going to be five years away probably till you see um, batteries that really double that. So it depends what you need. I mean, it gets back to what um, Stephanie was talking about in terms of these vehicles is if it's a once one time in a year, you're going to go on a road trip. Well, then the EV is going to, 
be a challenge because you're going to have to stop and charge and wait for it. But if you're just using this day to day for a commuter thing, um, the EVs of today are bang on. I would I would add one little point. The the delineation is not so much the size and the range these days. It's the uh, how much voltage uh, you can charge with, uh, like the 800 volts on the Taycan and the Ionic Five that uh, Andrew mentioned earlier um, is a should be a, a fairly inexpensive, comparatively inexpensive. Uh, EV and it will be available with 800 volts. So if uh, I would say that's the delineation, buy that one if you need to buy something right now. But I suspect more within a year or so, more and more will be introducing vehicles with 800 volts, and that's the thing you're waiting for. If the car has got 800 volts charging, buy it now. Okay, fair enough. Now we have a, a question in from Mike, and I'm going to set this up because all of us. People may not know this, but auto journalists, for some reason, love station wagons and hatchbacks. Canadians in general really like hatchbacks, but viewers may not know, but we all love station wagons, and it, we go on press trips and the wagons, we all go to the wagons. Mike wants to know how come Canadians like wagons and Americans seem not to, so he's wondering <laughs> why automakers aren't stepping up and selling wagons. We've had it half explained that they're, we're the tail. They're the dog, we get what Americans order. But are we gonna see any vehicles pushing into that niche? It is a niche now. Mainstream wagons aren't mainstream anymore. But anyone got any thoughts for Mike on uh, what might happen up here? Oh boy. <laughs> Do we really wanna answer that one? Because I think it wouldn't be very polite to our American friends. Well, no. <laughs> um, it's, it's uh, okay, I, I, you know what? I'm gonna stay away completely from the why. Um, we'll see a few more. Uh, unfortunately, it'll be mostly on the luxury side of things where they can afford to bring in, you know, Audi can afford to bring in uh, 100 of, of, of their Avant or something like that. On the mainstream stuff, I just don't see it. Uh, you're exactly right. We are the tail. They are the dog. And they will never, ever, ever bring in station wagons. <laughs> Well, and David, there's, there's an all-wheel drive component to that one as well, right? Because your luxury station wagons tend to be available with all-wheel drive, and Canadians are convinced that that's something that they need. Is it necessarily? Yeah, I mean, in a couple of weeks that we've had here in Toronto, it's been nice to have all-wheel drive, but winter tires are just as important in that equation. But with, with people are going to buy what they think they need, and if they think they need all-wheel drive, and it's not available in a mainstream wagon, they're not going to buy it. But whereas, you know, Audi and and the other luxury brands tend to have standard all-wheel drive, and so it, it ups the uh, the appeal a little bit there. We hear a lot that the Canadian market is closer in its preferences to the European market than it is to the American market, which you know is sort of disparate to to what we've been saying just now about how we kind of get what Americans buy. So it's these things are are all intertwined. Um, that being said, Volvo was selling a, the V90 here for a couple of years and, and quietly discontinued it last year because they weren't selling enough. So here we are. Demand, supply, yeah. Isaac has a really good question and it represents, I think, what we hear from all our readers and viewers when they do ask us about car buying questions, which is what's the best choice going to be in the next two to three years? Ice engine, hybrid, EV, something else. Every time someone goes to buy a car right now, this is what they're facing down. What am I going to need a couple of years from now? Are we at a tipping point? I'd like to know what each of you think in the next couple of years. What do you think people should be definitely looking at and perhaps entertaining a change? I can go first on this one. Um, I've got a pretty strong opinion about the fact that I think um, Toyota is going in the right direction by making conventional hybrid technology affordable in the cars that people are actually buying um, within a couple thousand dollars on most of the products, uh, the mainstream ones like the RAV4 hybrid, the Highlander hybrid. Um, and there's just no reason not to choose it anymore. If, if you can bear that small price difference, it, they're, they're better driving vehicles, better acceleration, better fuel economy. Um, and just all around, there's, there's not much reason not to anymore in the Toyota lineup specifically. Some other automakers, um, they're, they're not closing that price gap as well. They're not making hybrid technology as widely available or they just don't have the capability to do that. Um, but I think in the next two or three years that we're, we're going to have to see more of that, not only because of regulations, but also just because the, the demand is, is going to drive that supply. If I, if, if I was buying a car right now, the choice would be absolutely easy. 
be a Toyota RAV4 Prime plug-in hybrid, without a question. I, I just drove one for a month. Um, most of the time I was driving electrically. Uh, my average fuel economy over a thousand kilometers was 2.9 liters per hundred kilometers. I could plug it into 110 volts. Um, and unlike the EVs that um, Andrew um, uh, mentioned, when I do want to go on a long trip and I go on lots of long trips, I don't have to do anything inconvenient. It's an absolutely stupendous vehicle and it's fast. It's fast. It's, it's 302 horsepower. It gets to 100 kilometers an hour in, in six seconds. There's absolutely no downside uh, to the RAV4 other than, you know, it costs a bit more than uh, the regular hybrids that uh, Stephanie mentioned. But if you buy it in Quebec, you get $13,000. I, um, I have a friend who has a Volvo XC60 T8 plug-in hybrid, and she uses the gas engine so infrequently that she gets aging fuel warnings. She lives in the city. She goes back and forth 20 kilometers a day. She says, I don't even feel I tank up all the way anymore because I'm going to have to force it to drive in, in, uh, in gas to empty it before I actually use it all. Andrew, I think I know what, which direction you're going to go on this. But Well, I mean, it all, it all comes down to, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the question is a good one, but it all comes down to what you need a vehicle for. If you need a vehicle to go to work, if you're putting 100 kilometers, uh, 200 kilometers on your vehicle in a day, you're not going to go on big road trips, then an EV is going to suit you just fine. Um, the PHEVs, the plug-ins are a great, I mean, they're not a half step and they're not a stepping stone, I don't think. I think that they are a real world vehicle. And I think for a lot of people who don't understand that technology, they should go to a dealership, drive a plug-in and really get a sense of uh, the kind of utility of driving on electric day to day and then having the ability to go on a big trip and just fill it up with gas. So I think both Stephanie and David are right. I think plugins are, are a real real world solution to uh, kind of what ails us right now. One thing Daniel's asking, one thing we haven't talked about yet is the luxury car. He's wondering in our opinions, uh, what's the best luxury car on the market right now? Oh, there's not leaving a lot of wiggle room, is it Daniel? <laughs> Jill, what's the best luxury car on the market right now? I just drove the uh, the Genesis G80, and I was extremely um, impressed with it. Um, unlike Mr. Woods, I kept it right on on pavement. <laughs> oh no, he had a G8, yeah, GV80. Um, I, I really think that uh, I really think that um, Genesis is is making the kind of inroads. Um, not necessarily because it's the best vehicle out there, but because it's giving you all of this, um, the, the luxury and the performance that we're expecting, but it's at, um, at a more affordable price point than a lot of its competitors. And, uh, it, I think right now, as far as, as how it, how it works and how it's priced, the, the biggest issue that Genesis has is is the badge where if you pull into the country club, well, uh, Mercedes, Audi, BMW, Genesis, e even Lexus, but then Lexus was at a point where it wasn't, it wasn't the, um, the brand and, and now it can fit in there. And I think Genesis just has to wait its turn. David luxury car. Same one I mentioned before Porsche Taycan. Okay. Steph, do you have a favorite? That was going to be my pick as well. I mean, if you're going to spend the money, you might as well get the, the best of what's on the market here, period, EV or otherwise. And that, that Taycan, like, it, it drives fantastically. And um, as we've mentioned, it's got that su super fast charging capability. In theory, you can you can charge it in about 10 minutes. There's there's not a lot of downside, depending on how you use your vehicle. But if we're talking cars, the, the Taycan's a big one. Okay. Andrew, I've got a different question for you. Tony's wondering what new cars, uh, plug-ins with extended range, such as the Honda Clarity, I'm sorry, are we going to see in Canada? In and terms of plug-ins? Yeah. Or, or um, I mean, the Clarity is a plug-in, so... Yeah. Extended range. I think you're going to... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're going to see all the manufacturers kind of do that step. I've got, talking about what's in my driveway right now, I've got a BMW 330e plug-in. So um, I think that uh, you're just like with EVs, you're going to see all the manufacturers have plug-ins. So again, it's a matter of just determining your price point and then what you're looking at. Um, David's point about the RAV4, I think is interesting simply because 
it's got a big range in terms of electric. That's the problem with a lot of these plugins is you've got 20 kilometers of range. So it's, it's kind of like a, you know, it's, it, it doesn't really do anything in terms of fuel economy for you. It's more just a kind of selling point almost. But I think when you're seeing more and more, once you get a plug-in with a hundred kilometers of range or 150 kilometers of range, then that's kind of an interesting thing. And I think that's not far away. I think probably by next model year, 2022, maybe 2023, you're going to see those vehicles and that will be interesting to see the pickup rate for those. I, I, I completely, completely agree with Andrew. Uh, when it gets to a hundred. Yeah. Uh, when it gets to a hundred, there's no reason to buy another vehicle that isn't a plug-in hybrid. And, and to your point about uh, pricing, I just uh, uh, tested back to back the um, uh, plug, uh, the plug-in uh, RAV4 that I just mentioned, but also the, um, the X5 plug-in. And, you know, the, the X5 drove way better. It's more powerful and everything else. But guess which one got the most range? It was Toyota. You know, you pay double the money and you get 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers less range. Okay, one last question, Hill, and it's on the heels of what we're discussing already. Giles is wondering your thoughts on the Mazda MX-30 and the range extender engine for now only available in the U.S. Here in Canada, it's really needed in winter, especially with the lower range on EVs. BMW tried it on the i3. So far, only Mazda and BMW have offered this feature. So range extender engine, what applications is that going to have here in Canada? I, I, I mean, I can weigh in. I think it's a really interesting technology, but I'm not sure that it's going to be um, embraced by many automakers. Um, for the, the interesting thing is the, the MX-30 with the range extender is going to come to Canada. Um, as far as I know, it's going to have a Wankel engine as the range extender. And um, I'm going to disagree with that, Andrew on this because the difference between a, a really good plug-in hybrid and a electric vehicle with a range extender in actual day-to-day -day terms isn't that different. Um, uh, the, the good thing about the, um, the, um, the uh, Mazda is it should have, I think, 200 kilometers before the gas would kick in which would make it extremely useful and you could still drive it uh you know to ottawa without you know having to charge it up you could just gas it up so i actually like that technology i think it's i don't know if anybody else will adapt ad adopt it but it would work for me for sure okay before we start wrapping up we're at the auto show we're walking around looking at all the cool cool stuff so i'd like to know what each of you would want to be taken home from the show Let's start with Jill. I, we're back to the Nissan Frontier. I'm really looking forward to this. The styling is great. The size is right. I want to see if it lives up to the promise. And if it does, it's going to be a contender. Andrew? Um, the, the vehicle I mentioned earlier, the Nissan Area, I can't wait to drive it. Um, I think that it is going to be one of the, uh, a big hit in um, kind of the crossover for people buying EVs. I think a lot of people with a gas crossover will see the Nissan Area and really want to drive it. David? Uh, I'm going to go against type. I would probably uh, mention or want to drive home the cheapest car I've mentioned. Uh, the um, the Hyundai uh, Elantra N-Line. I have a real soft spot for little 1.6 liter turbo front wheel drivers. Uh, I, re I really do. Um, you know, if I had all the money in the world, I'd buy a Taycan. What can I say? Get this, people. I own that Elantra N-Line that David's talking about. It's probably the first time in our lives that we've crossed and met up. Stephanie, what do you want to drive home from the auto show? Well, I feel like I'm being very different from everyone else here. I guess I've spent too much time in three-row SUVs lately because I'm the one taking home a supercar. I can't wait to drive that <laughs> and check that out. I'm a racer girl at heart um, after all. And so, uh, yeah, I, I'm really intrigued by the plug-in hybrid powertrain and I uh, can't wait to see what that car can do. Stephanie, I should have one by March, late March. I'll bring it to your house. Okay? <laughs> I'll be waiting. Time drives fast when you're having fun. That wraps up our 2021 virtual auto show. I want to thank our, our panelists, our terrific production team at BBC, and of course, you, the viewers. Be sure to join us for our upcoming events, Auto Manufacturing in Canada on March 3rd. And on March 10th, when will autonomous cars be ready for Canada? Register for both events at events.driving.ca. <laughs> events thank you, everybody. This has been a blast.